Welcome to the director's chair with Quentin Tarantino, volume one. <laughs> yeah, you can slip those two. Hey, Mark. Oh, where's the close up? Is it that one? Hi, I'm Quentin Tarantino, and you're watching the El Rey Network. Here we go. For set. And action. Welcome, senor. I'm so excited to have you here on the El Rey Network. I was <laughs> laughing all the way driving up here just thinking about what we were doing. So I'm actually saying. kind of curious about what questions you want to ask. Well, I've been preparing this interview for 22 years. Ah, <laughs> true that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got footage of stuff I'm going to show that I've kept for 22 years, things that I've um, recorded while being with you, be inspired by you. So a lot of the stuff I want to talk about is really just kind of process. I mean, what the mm -hmm. director's chair is about is a director interviewing another director yeah, about yeah. the craft, because mm -hmm. we all approach it differently. Mm -hmm. And it's very inspiring to people to hear someone's process because it really defines how they do what they do. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though I've known you so long, there's still a lot of things I don't know about just how you do it. Let me interrupt one thing. Do you sure. remember that moment? Um, I mean, we're now sitting here in my movie theater. You're not a screening room. F that. All right, now it's this movie theater. But do you remember when I first started collecting prints? I had an apartment on, off of Crescent Heights. Oh, absolutely. And we, we put the projector in the living room and so we could throw it on the kitchen wall because it was like the bigger throw. And we'd be sitting there with just Dubatine covering the windows because <laughs> it was the only place that got direct lights and naturally I turned that into a screening room so I could block all that out. And we're sitting there watching a 16 millimeter print of something around, I think White Lightning, I think. And I turned to you and go, hey Robert, isn't this the life? <laughs> <laughs> And it was just so it was just so fun. I mean, you you always love cinema. You always love movies. Yeah, stringing up your little 16 millimeter, and we're skipping work that day. We're playing hooky. Sometimes yeah. we had things to do. We're <laughs> supposed to be responsible. And you would call me sometimes. People, your assistants would call me and say, "We can't find Quentin anywhere. Do you know where he is?" And I go, "I don't know where he is." Yeah, I'm saying, and I get a call you. from you. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, I get a call from you, and you go, "Hey, man, I'm totally playing hooky today. <laughs> you want to play hooky? Too? All right. You know what? How often is this going to happen? I'll go over." And you'd have white lightning up, yeah. and you just turn around and go. Isn't this the life? We're here watching our own movies on our own screening room. And the screening room wasn't a screening room. It, it wasn't. Even screen That's the magic of yeah, cinema. Right. Just seeing the image flickering in your home and seeing it the way you remember. And that kind of love for cinema, I just, we've had so many conversations over the year about mm. movies. But I wish more people were privy to that. So that's kind of what this is about. Because yeah. I know they would just be inspired by it. Mm -hmm. According to filmmaker and historian Peter Bogdanovich, and he would know, you are the single most influential director of our generation. And here's why. Reservoir Dogs. Five man job. Busted in and busted out of a diamond wholesalers. I'm acting like a professional. Pulp Fiction. I'm a shit medieval on your ass. Sit goddamn. Everybody be cool, this is a robbery. Jackie Brown. How you doing, Miss Jack? Are you scared of me? Kill Bill Volume 1. You and I have unfinished business. Kill Bill Volume 2. Hello, kiddo. <laughs> Death Proof. You really need to be sitting in my seat. Inglorious Bastards. And hot! We will be cruel to the Germans. Through our cruelty, they will know who we are. Django and Chain. What's your name? Django. D J A N G O. The D is silent. And soon, The Hateful Eight. What an amazing groundbreaking filmography from someone who was essentially self-taught and self-made, and who single-handedly revolutionized cinema at that time. I wanted to kind of go back in just the early days and how you started to become someone who wanted to tell stories visually, because you could have chosen many paths telling stories and you chose visual. Some boys are into monsters, some boys are into sports, some boys are into cars. I was always into movies. But I actually remember my parents even saying, oh, Quentin's gonna grow up and be a director someday. Just because they just knew how much I loved movies. I didn't even think I knew what a director was then. And when you're younger and you know you see movies and you know that that's what you want to be part of, you probably want to be an actor because that's what you see. That's the tangible thing. I started like at an acting class, but I realized I really wasn't like a lot of the other students. They were about acting. They were about getting jobs. They were about becoming movie stars. I was really about cinema. I was really about movies and about the history of movies and the future of movies. My heroes had actually become directors. Right. Uh -huh. They weren't actors. I wanted to become an actor so I could work with Sergio Leone or work with Martin Scorsese or learn Japanese and go to Japan and work with uh, Akira Kurosawa. Learn Italian, work with Mario Bava. That's what I wanted to do. Oh, right. I just kind of realized, you know, I don't think this acting thing is for me. I don't think appearing in movies, appearing in movies isn't enough. I want the movies to be my movie. Right. 
I want it to be mine. Just being in it isn't enough. I want I want to figure out what the movie is. I want and I want it to, I want to own the movie. Hmm. Once you actually start thinking about directing, if you look at something like Good and the Bad and the Ugly, or uh, Once Upon a Time in the West, well, that's directed. You can actually literally see what the director does and the way the characters, you know, enter frame and exit frame and the way the camera does its thing. It's like almost like a directing school. It doesn't mean you have to direct like that, but it shows you what directing is. Right. Shows you cinematically. And was it also partly watching movies and going, you know, I would structure this differently, or I would tell a story differently, and I'm never going to get a script like that as an actor. I, I would have to go. I don't create think I it. thought about structure that much at that point in time. Mm -hmm. I, I think it started off with me thinking of shots. Mm -hmm. At the time, I never even thought about writing. But where I actually realized I had a little bit of talent at it was going to acting classes, because I didn't want to do just the normal Samuel French plays and stuff. I would go and see a movie and I'd see some neat scene. I was always doing bizarre scenes in acting class. You know, I'd see Jackie Chan's big brawl and like see a scene and then like write it down. Write and it down. Uh, you know, the, the, the De La De La Rente is Flash Gordon. Uh, remember the scene in Flash Gordon where it's like, uh, it's like Flash Gordon and Timothy Dalton are like sticking their hands in the tree oh, where yeah, the monster yeah, yeah. is. Or, like, it was like a comic book version of Deer Hunter or something. <laughs> yeah, right. Must be my lucky day. You do them as monologues or you do them with somebody? No, I do. I, I did it with another guy. I got a refrigerator box and cut a bunch of holes in it. Oh, funny. And uh, I cast some guy to be Flash Gordon and I was the Timothy Dalton character. That's a great scene, but it's not that long of a scene. Would you add to the scene? I would add to the scene because what happened is I never had like the script or anything. Right. I mean, but basically, I always, always had a good memory. So I would see a scene from a movie and I would just remember it. And I would go home and I'd write it from memory. And anything else I couldn't remember or anything else good I came up with in the meantime, I'd add it into the scene because it was just my scenes. And then little by little by little, I just I started adding more and more <laughs> and more to the scenes. And that was me learning how to write dialogue or just me realizing that I could write dialogue. And I never really took it seriously until a member of the class, a guy named Ronnie Coleman, I think is Quentin, you're... You're really good. You're you're as good as Patty Chayefsky. What do you mean I'm as good as Patty Chayefsky? <laughs> well, you know, we did that scene in class from uh, Marty, and you just wrote it down, and you you gave me this handwritten scene from Marty, and it included this entire monologue about a fountain. Well, I actually have the original Patty Chayefsky script, and there was no monologue about fountain in there. <laughs> that was completely added by you. You added an entire monologue to it. Wow. And it was just as good as the Patty Chayefsky stuff. That's great. And, you know, somebody saying something like that to you actually got me to start taking it seriously, that maybe I did have a talent for that. That, that almost knighting by somebody, just mm -hmm. somebody saying early in your life, you know, somebody, you know, tells you anything like that, you should listen because you don't always know. And we're gonna talk about this later. About yeah. Sometimes you don't know when you're making something that's gonna be groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look groundbreaking when yeah. you're staring at it. But how old were you at that time? Like. 1920. Wow, so this is, you know, 11 years before Reservoir Dogs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is way before. That's yeah. awesome. Tell me about Reservoir Dogs. That was an idea I had that just completely was based out of something I thought I could do. You know, with a few thousand dollars, I could actually make this. I could just get a bunch of actors, we rehearse it. And uh, finally, after years of nobody wanting it, the company Cinetel bought True Romance. And so I actually did have like 30,000 coming. And this is, you know, I'm a guy who had only made 10,000 a year. Right. And so I decided I would go out and uh, I was gonna make a movie with that money. And I didn't really think anyone was ever gonna take a chance on me to actually direct a real movie and done in a real movie style. I thought I would have to, uh, you know, just do it very guerrilla style. Then I showed it to Lawrence Bender and he was like, Quentin, this is really good. And I actually think I could get some real money, even if real money meant like a half a million dollars or 400,000 or something. I was like, no, no, I don't believe that. I don't buy that. I, You'd I, waited too long by everybody that point. Everybody mm -hmm. said, uh, no, nah, it's never gonna happen. I don't know if I would even trust me, so why should anybody else trust me? And he said, well, you know, um, give me a month with it. You can wait like a month to make your home movie. And if we can't, then I'm like full steam in my head and that's the way to go. But if I get interest in a month, then we'll actually try to do it for real. And he got interest in a month, in the, you know, literally a, a very few months time uh, from like the point that I wrote it to the point that we were shooting was 
maybe five or six months. Wow, it's really fast. And I was doing a real movie with a real budget, with real actors, Harvey Cattell, for a real company that was taking a chance on me for like $1.3 million. I actually showed up on my first day and there were trucks. Wow. You know, on the street, like, oh my God, that was almost a bigger deal than seeing the camera right. or anything was to see the trucks parked in front of our location. And frankly, you know, I, I identified more with the PAs than anybody else on the set because we were all about the same level of experience. The only sets I'd ever been on where I worked was I was a, a PA on the Dolph Lundgren exercise home video. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so that was my only working job where I actually was part of a crew. But, you know, it's one thing to say, hey, I want to make a movie, hey, I want to make a movie. And then finally somebody goes, Okay, well, they're gonna take a chance on you. Like, oh, holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but you didn't blink. Yeah, you know? well, you know, I, I, I blinked, all right? Uh, I blinked. And, you can't and, tell. And, uh, I mean, not during the doing it, all right? Do your names. Mr. Brown, Mr. White, Mr. Blonde, Mr. Blue, Mr. Orange, Mr. Pink. Your first film right out the gate had a, a big cast. You were showing what, what a force you were in the directing world, being able to take that group of guys, direct them so brilliantly. How well, did you do that? Well, because I started off as an actor, and actually the only like uh, training I'd ever done has, has been as an actor. I, I always knew that that would be one of my strengths as far as like dealing with actors and writing the characters and dealing with them and getting the best out of them mm -hmm. and being able to talk actor talk. I was all about my shots, but I wasn't all about the lenses and the lighting and all that stuff that maybe a lot of film students at the time were. What I could do is put a bunch of actors in a room and get the best out of them. Right. And actually kind of rehearse the scenes and like get them to the right kind of pitch. You gotta remember that this story is about you and how you perceive the events that went down. The only way to do that, my brother, keep saying it, saying it, and saying it, and saying it, and saying it. We had a two week rehearsal and we had chewed the rag on the material so much and they were so ready to go it was it gave me confidence i knew i was the best person to do this movie right. i knew this material better than anybody else would know it and these guys really respected me they wanted to make my movie and it was the diving into the material that just gave me confidence i was ready to do it can't imagine a more confident person than you. So to hear you say that, I think really will give people, you know, some consolation if they feel nervous about a step they're gonna take. You should feel nervous. You should feel some yeah. fear, because that means you're, you're embarking on something that is worth your time. But if you're doing a piece, that's the answer. Right. Get to know that piece, know that piece. There was nobody better. I, I chewed the rag on it so much. There was nobody better than me to tell this story. Now, whatever happens after that is what happens after that. But I knew this story. Everybody else on that set could know a hell of a lot more about filmmaking than I did, and they all did. But I knew this material better than they did. Hey, show time. Grab your jacket. I'm parked outside. I'll be right down. Everything was like kind of new and like, you know, finishing your day, getting your day done, going to new locations, working with all these people, getting everything that work, you know, being the director of the crew. You know, there is, it's not just, you know, one, you're an artist, but two, you're, all, you know, you're also a general, you, you're the leader. You have to lead and you have to lead by example. So then you do all that and then that's done and now it's editing. It's a completely new experience. And so you go through that and then now it's the sound mix. And that's this really huge experience. Right. But what I just kind of noticed is that, you know, there was always like just like a, a new mountain right. to climb. And my late editor is not here anymore, Sally Minky. She was, uh, we had done all our films together uh, before she passed on, including Reservoir Dogs. Now she had done movies before too. So once I was actually finished with the edit of the movie, once I had locked the picture and that was the picture and everyone agreed and that it was exactly what I wanted, she kind of took a little bit more of the lead because she knew about the sound process more than I did, knew about the lab work more than I did. And I'm starting to get a little tired now, but that's actually when she would pick up, right. all right? And she'd just take just a little bit more of the lead position and ram things through. So when like the print would come back and I didn't, you know, there was a, a problem with the lab, and I didn't like something or whatever, I might be more, along, my, more inclined to just be sad about it because <laughs> it didn't quite work out. She was like, no, the work is unacceptable, send it back. Right, right, professional. Yeah, and stuff. then I'm sort of like, God, she's been kind of mean to them, you know? It's <laughs> like, no, they can do it better than that. That's just absolutely positively unacceptable. That's good. <laughs> What's your favorite part of the directing process? I don't really have one favorite part. Each part 
is my favorite part Playing at it. that given time. And right when I'm kind of done with it and sick and tired of it, it's usually over. Right. And now I'm moving on to another part that's really exciting. So it's like, it's not that I think editing is so much more fun than shooting or shooting is so much more fun than writing. Writing is a tremendous amount of fun for me now. I really have a great time. But when I'm done with the script, I'm sick of writing. <laughs> I'm done it now. Now I want to put the material on its feet. Now I want to make it better. And now I want to put in the other voices and the other people. And now we're going to leave that document in the dust and do something even better than that. But after shooting forever, I'm done with it by the time I'm done. And now editing just seems so great. And it yeah. seems now it's now it's you know now it's more of a solitary experience again as opposed to this carnival. Right. You know, it's a little closer to writing uh, again. And so you know, so uh, like you know, it's but it's between those three sections. It's right. the writing and the directing and editing. By the time that's over, now for the first time you're really looking at it like a movie. To this day, I can't read a novel and not turn it into a movie to some degree. <laughs> he gave us enough confidence with this idea by stringing us along that we went forward with it. Here we go. For set. Here we go. For set. And action. I had a question about just uh, your unique storytelling. I mean, when did you, what led you to constructing that sort of back and forth nonlinear? style that you did in Reservoir Dogs that really kind of took mm -hmm. people by surprise with the chapters mm -hmm. and introducing the characters. Where did you get the idea from? I'd read novels and in a novel you can start in the middle of the story. And an analogy I would give is uh, Mo, Larry and Curly and they're doing something and it's just moving in the forward momentum of what they're doing that's taking place in the here and now. But now it comes to chapter three and chapter three is about Mo and that happened two years before. Right. And uh, so you accept it in a novel. Yeah, yeah, and you read it in the novel, and you read uh, what you know, kind of how Mo got there a little bit, or explains more who Mo is, and then you go back to chapter four, boom, and now you're back into the same uh, current situation, the same thrust of stuff. But now you know more about Mo than you did before, mm -hmm. and then the next chapter comes, and now they're going to isolate Larry. And maybe that only happened a day before, but it sets up his situation. And to this day, I can't read a novel and not turn it into a movie to some degree <laughs> in my mind. Anyway. I always thought if you did it the way they did it in novels, it would be even more cinematic. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't Give me it would be exciting, and if you pulled it off, it would be fun. Say it! The cross cutting would be neat. I started shooting, so I blasted my way out of there. And it's not just one thing. To do movies the way novels tell stories when they when they move around like that, that, that would be inherently cinematic. And they just put it all in chronological order was inherently not cinematic. It was drab. Do you remember a time when you figured that out, where you read a novel in particular and it's like, how come the movies aren't like this and I'm gonna do this? It's not one novel that got me thinking that way. It was more just every time I read a novel like that, I thought I figured out how to do it. Right. And I knew that that's not what they, that's not what Paramount would do mm -hmm. if it had the opportunity. Especially if you're talking about coming off of the 80s which I think it was a very oppressive time for cinema. The studio system was, you know, one of the more repressive times to come out since the 50s. I mean, things were just very standard. Things had gotten very, very homogenous. There was, wasn't a whole lot of creativity going on as far as, like, doing new things. You know, people like, like Paul Verhoeven or David Lynch were really put in boxes mm. of, as being weird. Everyone had to be likable. You know, there was, like, never uh, 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 dark shades of, of things. Like, you know, you read crime novels and, and characters could do so much and be so twisted. And that they ever talked in the, in the 80s about doing those movies, they always had a wimp out ending. They'd say, oh, you can't do a movie about that. It's just too, the characters are too unlikable or it's too uh, uh, immortally ambiguous. That just was the death in, in the 80s. So I'm kind of coming off of that. And then I did finally have one thing that I thought proved that I was right is uh, uh, Fred Chalepsi did uh, an adaptation of one of the John Le Carre novels, uh, The Russia House, oh, wow. with uh, uh, Sean Connery and Michelle Pfeiffer. And I never read the book, but you could tell he kept the structure of the book, right. which was really moving back and forth. And mm -hmm. the, the story actually doesn't catch up with itself until about midway through. Right. You know, and then from that point on, everything is everything. Yeah. But before that, it's really kind of hopping around back and forth, and, and it was exciting. 
it was really, really fun. And so I was like, oh, see, I, I knew this would work. <laughs> <laughs> Those moments are just so important, especially when you're doing something that's been done for so long, like cinema, yeah. when you just question something and you go, how come no one's ever done this? Or why don't they do it that way? I felt yeah. that on Sin City. I remember looking at the comic, the graphic novel, reading it and going, this is more cinematic than a movie. Yeah, yeah. This, the way he's just putting a drawing while this voiceover is going, and it's action packed, but his yeah. voiceover is very calm. Yeah, why does it have to be a facsimile it, of this? Why, why can't it, it be, be this? Be that, just shoot that, yeah. make it like that, and that will blow people away, because yeah, they're yeah. used to just seeing a movie. Mm -hmm. And visual storytelling, the way Frank was doing it on the graphic novel, I just wanted to see that move. Yeah. And the way you saying you read a novel and go, why don't they make a movie like that? That storytelling, yeah. it should work. You shouldn't have to adapt it to a film. It should just work because yeah. it's still storytelling. I would think it would be kinetic. It would be exciting, and you know, uh, uh, the audience has to know it's in good hands. Right. It has to know that there's gonna, there's a there there somewhere. But as long as it's in good hands, it likes kind of not knowing and waiting to find out. Uh, one of the hallmarks of your films mm -hmm. from the very beginning has just been your musical choices in your style. Were you always just a big music fan? Well, I got really lucky. I mean, because I could be stuck in a situation where I was doing really low budget movies, I wouldn't be able to afford anything. In the case of Reservoir Dogs, um, we had like $13,000 uh, uh, set aside for our entire music budget. But I knew I needed Stuck in the Middle with you. We had to get Stuck in the Middle with you for that, that price. At the time, the, uh, the woman with the power of the pen there, the kind of the person that had, you know, had the yes or no at EMI was this really lovely, uh, lovely lady named Pat Lucas. And so Stacy Sher, who later became a producer on Pulp Fiction and was one of the producers on uh, Django Unchained, she knew Pat Lucas, wrote her a big blowjob letter about <laughs> how talented I was and if you're inclined to, I think Quentin is going to, it could be another Kubrick. And so we just really kind of romanced her. We had to know before we shot the scene. And so she had that much time to think about it and finally she thought about it and she decided to give us a song for $13,000. Okay, what's your music budget? Well then that's what I'm gonna do it for. Right. So we spent our entire music budget on uh, uh, Stuck in the Middle with You. <laughs> That was going to be the only song in the film, so be it. But then we got the idea of maybe if we got a record deal, that record deal will pay for the rest of the songs. Mm. And we started getting a little cocky about the idea. And actually there was one guy kind of stringing us along who never came through. Yet he gave us enough confidence with this idea by stringing us along that we went forward with it. Yeah. I don't think we actually would have gone forward with it if we didn't have somebody kind of lying to us. Mm -hmm. But then we were committed, and then we actually made it happen. Right, <laughs> and then that became such a, you know, hallmark soundtrack yeah. that you just. Well, I got to that. really show it off. You know, my, you know, my, my talent, be that as it may. All right, of putting music and and, and scenes together. <laughs> when I'm seeing my movie for the eighth time or the ninth time, or hell, the hell, even the third time or fourth time. I'm waiting for the music sequences because those are those are the fun parts. Those right. are really the fun parts. That's the, the like, you know, the surfing parts where you're just gliding. It really is an anthology. It's three separate stories. No one looks at it that way anymore. The hero just killed that person, <laughs> and the, who is this guy? What's going on? <laughs> Here we go, for set. And action. I remember when I went back to work on Desperado at Columbia Pictures on the Sony lot, we ended up uh, finding out we had offices right next to yeah, each other. Yeah. You're writing Pulp Fiction at that time. You got a corpse in a car, minus a head in a garage. Take me to it. <laughs> How did you come up with Pulp Fiction? Because it fascinates me how you came up with this structure. You, you thought originally to do it 
as uh, short films that you could just shoot. I thought about the idea, oh, you know, why don't I do this as like an anthology with, with like different directors and stuff. And I was friends with Tony Scott at the time and I was always a huge admirer, as we both are. He had done True Romance. So uh, I proposed to him and his uh, uh, partner at the time, Bill Unger, I go, what if we do a thing we call Pulp Fiction? I'll write one of the stories, I can write another story, Tony could do one and I'll write a third one and we get another director to do another one. And they were like, wow, that's great, let's do that. So I started working on one. And I did have the basic idea that would be Vincent Vega and Marcellus Wallace's wife, that story. And so I thought, well, you know, I could write that and then we can go out and do that as a short film and that would be kind of cool, shoot it on 16 millimeter. So I did have that kind of idea. And when I had had that idea of doing it as a short film, I, I wanted to possibly do it with uh, Roger Avery, who was a good friend of mine at the time. And he was also working at one of the video stores and I really liked his writing, we encouraged each other. So Roger, why don't you come up with a, a story of your own? And he came up with like the Butch Coolidge story, the boxer story. He didn't have the gold watch speech. He had a gold watch, but he didn't have the speech or the reason why the gold watch was so important. Now, little man, I gave the watch to you. <gasps> I like the cliche aspect of it. I wanted the storylines to be cliches. The boxer's supposed to throw, throw the fight and doesn't. Right. Uh, the, the hood that's supposed to take out uh, Mr. Big's mall, or uh, look but don't touch. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You're just the beard. And then, like, what happens? Then I started kind of thinking about the idea of them not being separate one-offs. Making it so maybe some characters can overlap. Right. And not in a gimmicky kind of way, but it just uh, all take place in the same world. You know, and a character who could be the lead of one story could just be a small part in the other and vice versa. Right. And the more I started thinking about really kind of tying them in together, even though the three stories would be separate, the more I said, no, I really need to have one hand right. take care of this. So I had to call Tony and go, yeah, I've decided I think this is going to be my next movie. And so then I went off to Amsterdam to write it. Get a load of this, all right. If you get stopped by a cop in Amsterdam, it's illegal for them to search you. I mean, that's the right that cops in Amsterdam don't have. Oh, man, I'm going. I love the evolution of an idea like that because it ended up being such a groundbreaking uh, movie. I'm but to me, it wasn't really a whole lot different than, like, say, Mario Bava's Black Sabbath, which is like, you know, three horror stories. We did one of those four yeah. rooms. Uh, there have been things like that before, but never like three, three separate crime stories. That was unique. Yeah. And the idea that like the three separate stories could end up telling one story. Yeah. Well, that had never really been right. done before to that degree. And it's you know, and it still is. I mean, I mean, it's actually the best compliment because it really is an anthology. It's three separate stories. No one looks at it that way anymore. Or even then, they all looked at it as one big unified piece. But that's kind of hard to do. But it actually is three separate stories. It seems so new. I mean, I mean it was new <laughs> at the time. Somebody, a friend of yours, I don't remember, it was a producer friend or an actor. Somebody asked you. Okay, after they saw the movie. So when John Travolta, so he was really, he's still dead though, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. He's just never seen. Yeah, no, movie. it's like, yeah, he's dead, right? And I go, well, of course he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> but that yeah. wasn't a dream sequence. Of course he's dead. <laughs> I mean, you know where you are, all right? You're back in the scene that you were at earlier. Now you're just going further with it. And it was a, wow. But it was a big, it was a big leap to ask them to do. And not everyone quite got it at the time, but most people did. Then like a little moment of confusion, but then they, oh, okay, I guess we're just back where we were at the beginning. Yeah, yes, you are. I mean, one of the things that was really exciting about watching the movie, I was always ahead of them in Pulp Fiction. They're right. in the entire running time for the most part. Right. If you stopped watching Pulp Fiction after the first hour, you know, you didn't even really see the movie. Like it takes an hour for it to really get going, for it to really revealing itself. There was this neat thing that happened with audiences every time, and I, and I watched it with a lot of audiences. The movie would start in that cafe with Tim Roth and Amanda Plummer, Pumpkin and Honey Bunny. Then it would go into the, the John Travolta, Sam Jackson part, then the John Travolta, Uma Thurman part, and then the boxer comes into it with Bruce Willis, and then we go back in time, and now it's Jules and Vincent again, and all that goes on. And little by little, you forget about Pumpkin and Honey Bunny and it's going on, and I've been ahead of you the entire time. Then when you'd cut to the exterior of the coffee shop, before mm -hmm. you go in the coffee shop, right. even though you never saw the exterior in the opening scene, the audience had caught up. Wow, that's great. And they knew, oh, that's what he's gonna do. Wow. Those two guys, the, the guy and the girl, the British guy and girl from the beginning, they're gonna be there. Oh my God. And it was this kind of thing where it's like, you son of a bitch. 
I haven't understood how you're telling this story <laughs> from the very beginning. But now, it's taken me this long, but now I get it. Right. Now I know, for the first time, I know what you're going to do. I've heard you at a few times say, if I do my job right, I'll be able to play the audience like a fiddle right mm -hmm. here. Because you really are tuned into what they were like. I've, I've always been pretty, attuned, I've always considered myself a part of the audience. Mm -hmm. So I don't like second guess it as far as like, oh, uh, I'm going to smarten it up or dumb it down or do anything to get to get a, an unnatural response. I know how I feel when I'm uh, uh, being jerked around and it's fun. And I do like jerking them around a little bit and it's, it's pretty easy. What do you make all this? Man, I don't even have an opinion. Well, you gotta have an opinion. I mean, do you think that God came down from heaven and stopped oh! Audiences didn't, didn't even realize how attuned they had got to the contrivances of movies because they were so used to it. So you could use that against them. You could leave the breadcrumbs that would indicate that you were gonna go the way all the other films had gone. And then all of a sudden you make a quick left turn and they're not prepared for that. <laughs> they didn't even know that they were anticipating what was gonna happen next, but they were. And so then you use their own knowledge against them. And that's exciting. Now all of a sudden the storytelling is infused with something. Now you can't predict it. I thought you were going to, oh, I, I never thought that guy would die. Or I know that guy's a goner. Oh no, he's not a goner. All right, oh my God, the hero just killed that person? <laughs> and the, the innocent people are dying and the hero doesn't care and they're just like cracking jokes and they're moving on? Who is this guy? What's going on? <laughs> we all want to do something different. Mm -hmm. However, when you're watching it with a regular old audience for the first time, all of a sudden, you know, you wanting to be Godard doesn't sound like such a great ambition when you got a bunch of people who want to be entertained. Here we go. For set. Here we go. For set. And action. And I like to talk about how some things that look like a failure aren't always. Mm -hmm. That's why I kind of like to keep a journal about mm -hmm. everything because sometimes when things don't go your way, you look back and you go, oh, well, thank God, thank yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> and Friday, May 14th, 1993, you had just finished the script mm -hmm. in the cast and you were talking to Christopher Walken, Harvey Cattell, Michael Madsen, Tim Roth, John Cusick, Matt Dillon, Larry Fishburne. TriStar had 30 days to green light your script. Mm -hmm. You're getting everything together, elements, budget, schedule, all that. So we walk in with all the cards. If TriStar takes a breath, we go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. They took a breath and you went somewhere else. And thank God. I remember at the time, because we were both in the lot, it was a big deal. It was like, it was like you, were, you were going in to be a made man. You were yeah, going yeah, right, yeah. I was waiting for the phone call. You were going to go in, turn in the script. What was the verdict? They said no. Mm -hmm. And you're off the lot. You're going somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And I was left there by myself. <laughs> I remember thinking, wow, that's, that really sucks. But then it would not be the same movie had you made it a TriStar. Well, yeah, it wouldn't have been the same movie because like, they just didn't have the faith in it. They would have thought it was weird. Well, what's funny is it was even weird to you. I mean, even for you. And there was a point, um, I have all these dates because I write everything down. Sunday, May 1st, 1994, we went to dinner. We talked movies. about 2.30 in the morning. I'm about to leave. And I asked you, um, Oh, how did, how did Pulp come out? Because I didn't get to see you at a screening for, for a bunch of your director friends, and I was in Texas, so I wasn't there. And you went, yeah, you know, I don't know. I mean, it just it still feels like, a, it doesn't feel like a real movie. And I said, what do you mean? You said, um, well, it still feels like a movie Quentin would make. It doesn't feel like, mm -hmm. like I mean, it still just doesn't feel like I've made a real movie yet. And, you know, me be trying to be supportive, because I've seen how excited you were from the beginning. Yeah. And you being a little down on it, uh, I was just like, oh, well, that's, you know, just try to be a supportive friend, going, oh, well, that's okay. I mean, it should, should be, you know, more like you. But it did, didn't seem like, it didn't seem like a real movie. It seemed like a crazy Quentin movie. It's what you called it. You, <laughs> you, you were almost disappointed that it was still felt like it had too much of your hand in it, which, of course, now you know that's the blessing of what you do, and that's right, what yeah, it should uh -huh. be. Mm -hmm. But at that early formative years of yourself, that was essential that well, you were at a place like Miramax. But it's also interesting, though, because it's like, like we all want to do something different and like you know do our own way. Mm -hmm. However, when you're watching it with a regular old audience for the first time, you don't really want it to be that different. You right. kind of want them to you want it recognize to it somewhat as a real movie <laughs> that like they might see on a Saturday night. <laughs> you want people to be entertained at the end of the day. You don't really and all of a sudden, you know, you wanting to be Godard doesn't sound like such a great ambition when you got a bunch of people who want to be entertained. <laughs> I just think it's so important for people to hear that even you didn't know what it yeah. was going to do because people don't, something that's groundbreaking and that's going to change cinema 
you don't recognize it. Nobody does. I think the time that it happened before most famously was on Star Wars. George Lucas got all his director friends, everybody, to look at it. It's De Palma. Spielberg. And they all were just like, oh, poor George. He wasted his time with this movie. What a fool's errand this was. Spielberg recognized it for being the, yeah. something that it could be. Um, but I talked to some of the directors because I wasn't able to go to that screening that you had yeah. for your director friends. And I was curious. I called up a couple of the people and said, well, how did it go? And they said, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know about this one. They had never they seen anything they'd like it. They never seen anything like it. It was like that Star Wars. That was our Star Wars. Pulp Fiction was like our Star Wars. Where yeah, we, but, not, there, not even we knew. But there was one person. There was who, one. Who was the Spielberg who, in the group? That, oh, Catherine Bigelow. Absolutely, uh, positively. Awesome. She was its biggest. Fan. Wow. Uh, she went nuts for Reservoir Dogs at Telluride, mm -hmm. and I'd always been a fan of hers. Yeah. So you hooked me up with her. Yeah, because so I, we I was following around uh, Telluride that yeah. whole time asking yeah, like, like near dark. Oh, near dark, near dark, near dark, near dark, near dark. Don't tell me, don't ask me about that movie. Oh no, that was and that's all I had, that's what I talked to her about. Near dark, near dark, near dark. All right. So. <laughs> <laughs> for her to say that, it's awesome. She wanted to put John Travolta in a, a Strange Days after seeing wow. that movie. She screened it for for uh, 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 Jim Cameron. And apparently, like when she did the screening, she goes, "Guys, you're in for a treat. I mean, you don't even know what you're gonna see. You don't even know what you're gonna <laughs> see. But I know what you're gonna see, and I can't wait to watch it with you guys." That, nobody else was saying that, right? right, at right. The, after, uh, after. At, after my little director screening with my uh, 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 friends, you know, there was even one of them that was uh, planning on, okay, I'm gonna have to have a hard talk with Quentin. Wow. Right, wow. Right. Uh, but I'll wait till he comes back from con. Oh. <laughs> I'll wait till he comes yeah, back never from mind, con. Never mind. We're not gonna have that. Know? The palm door. <laughs> Goes to. Pulp Fiction. Then all of a sudden I went in the palm door. And literally they left a message. Like, well, I was actually going to actually get a little tough with you. Uh, but I guess we can forget that. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell do I know? <laughs> What the hell I only made one movie too. <laughs> what the hell did anybody know at that time? It really changed movies. Because I was still at Columbia. And I remember the executives, when that movie did what it did, they came and they went. It was like uh, when Easy Rider had come out and suddenly the studios felt like dinosaurs. They were like, we're trying to make movies for youth. That's a youth film. That's what people are into. And we don't know how to do that. There's nothing else coming out even on our schedule that's even remotely like that, except maybe Desperado. Yeah, right, yeah. Because <laughs> I had already that's shot you closest. in. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but that was it. There was no nothing. So it was really turned the industry, and you know, audiences were exhilarated to go to the cinema again, and they weren't going to see anything like that till, well, till your next movie. Quick it! You were the first real rock star director. You were like hanging out with one of the Beatles. Sam Jackson, how did that relationship start? And it's it's like one of the great partnerships, you know, De Niro and Scorsese, John Woo and Chow Yun Fat, Ron Perlman and Guillermo del Toro. Ask him this question too. <laughs> what is it about those kind of partnerships that are that are so unique to filmmakers, or what's important to their process, or what does it mean to a filmmaker when they do that? And these actors, no matter how great they are, they always seem to be better when they're with their director counterpart. What is that? Oh, well, I mean, there's a few things with Sam. I mean. Um... Uh, we like a lot of the same kind of movies, all right? So it's not like he doesn't get it. You know, he comes from theater, so he comes from, you know, the work ethic of, like, the play is the thing. That's what, that's what we're doing here. Come on, let's get in character. He knows his dialogue left, right, and center, upwards and downwards. But then the thing, the thing that makes our relationship is just nobody says my dialogue the way Sam <laughs> Sam gets it a hundred percent. I mean he's a terrific artist, he's a terrific actor. Now Kristoff says my dialogue as good as Sam Jackson, but he doesn't say this the Sam Jackson way. <laughs> he's like complete he sings it in a completely other tune. But the way Kristoff and Sam Jackson do it, they turn it into the poetry that it was always supposed to be. They get the music in it, and they sing it. They sing 
the dialogue. They don't say it, they sing it. Mm -hmm. And it just takes off. It just takes off. It's just, it, it's alive. Most definitely. What's she gonna do then? Well, that's what I've been sitting here contemplating. First, I'm gonna deliver this case to Marcellus. Then, basically, I'm just gonna walk the earth. What you mean, walk the earth? You know, like Kane in Kung Fu. Sam's not like my buddy. Sam feels more like he's like my, you know, grumpy, cantankerous uncle. You know, he's a total smart ass. <laughs> Absolute smart ass, all right? Talks through the whole movie. Uh, makes fun of people all through the movie, <laughs> all right? Uh, you'd be doing a scene with an actor and like, oh, uh, honey, I'm sorry, honey, could you get out of my eye line? You're in my eye line. Ever do theater? A lot of motherfuckers in your eye line. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, He's like that. He's entertaining on this. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'd be standing up and there'd be something like, you know, this kind of rigging, all right? You pipey rigging uh, right above <laughs> us. And I'm standing up talking, now, Quentin, you're about to crack your head open <laughs> on that big pipe. Not that I wouldn't enjoy watching that, but I'm just going to let you know you will crack your head open. I know. Pipe. One of the most exciting times for me, I think, is when we met in the festival circuit because you made it seem, in particular, so fun. <laughs> Movie making seemed just so fun. And Ooh, what I was surprised, yeah. we're having a blast. You were having a blast, too. Um, and it was infectious. I mean, people, it was intoxicating. And after that movie, I doubled as your bodyguard. <laughs> it was insane. People would just follow you everywhere. They would just go crazy. You were the first real rock star director. We were like hanging out with one of the Beatles. That was the explosion of independent cinema in the 90s. A lot of people are you know, making really interesting noise. Alison Anders is doing her thing. Rick Linklater is doing his thing. And David Fincher now does seven. Then you come out with Desperado. It's cool essay. What actually kind of gives that rock star thing a little credence is younger people started actually looking possibly to filmmaking the way they had looked at starting a band before. Starting a band wasn't the way to express yourself. Getting a camera and trying to make a movie, that was the easier way to express yourself. You weren't expecting that when you made it, and, um, and to you, it was just like another movie that Quentin would make. Mm -hmm. How do you follow that up? This is a zeitgeist moment. This is a phenomenon. I'm not gonna get another phenomenon the next movie out. I go, I should throw them for a loop. Jackie Brown. Who can be a woman in her late 40s, you can tell she used to be really beautiful, and you kind of feel she could handle anything. Like, why? That sounds like Pam Greer to me. Took me in a little room, you go, can I read you? Kill Bill. And I sat down, I turned on my video camera. The bride speaks for the first time in the picture. She looks up at the man standing over her and says, Bill. It's your baby. We hear a bang. I wouldn't be surprised if 20 years from now, Inglorious Bastards is probably like the one they talk about the most. If you watch the acting right next to the camera, right in front of the actors, it's as if they are acting just and solely and utterly only for you. Yeah, yeah. Great job. <laughs>